You are listening to the Techie Leadership Show with Bogdan and Andrei. Hello and welcome to the Techie Leadership Show. Today with me I have Damon Borton, who since founding his company SEO National in 2007, writes for Forbes, has been featured in publications including Entrepreneur Magazine, BuzzFeed and USA Weekly, and has helped high-profile clients make more in a month in a month than they used to in a year. Now that's really impressive. And welcome to the show, Damon. Thanks, Andre. Looking forward to chatting. Same here. Do you want to add anything else about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm a family man. I've been married for 13 years. I have three kids. And we we're as we were joking before we hit record, I have a guy outside my office cutting down a tree. So if you awesome. hear any weird noises, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> he just decided to show up and do that this morning. So. Well, just to add some flair to the show. It's free yeah. music. We can consider it like free music. We don't have to yeah, pay for it. Yeah. It's free. Yeah. At the end, we can go and get his name and say, like, do you want to? Do you want credits for it? Well, let's, okay. let's see how good he does first. <laughs> okay. Well, so with that in mind, let's see. I'll let you choose. Do you want to start with the success story or the failure story? Which one do you think it's? Hey, I can talk about whatever, you know, I think both of them have, have value. So, um, flip a coin. Flip a coin. I don't have a coin around here. Uh, <laughs> but let's start in the, in the reverse order. Let's do it. Let's start with the leadership failure. So what uh-huh. is the biggest leadership failure you had the unfortunate experience of witnessing? Um, you know, I learn a lot from, I, I, I've been very fortunate that I haven't really had, um, significant failures myself, but I learn a lot from what I see in other people do. And, and there's okay. definitely a big leadership failure, um, prior to me starting my company, which actually contributed, you know, in the longer it ended up being a good thing, but one of my previous employers, so I've had SEO national for 13 years. So this was probably 15 years ago. Um, the gentleman I worked for, he was really successful, but it was a really toxic environment to work within. And so I was okay. able to take and learn from that and understand the value in personal time and privacy. And so now I can kind of gift that learning experience to my own team and and take away what I learned from that and, and be a better employer to my own team now. That sounds really good. When you say toxic environment, what was going on that made it so toxic? Um, it was just, you know, uh, there was a, a lack of, you know, human element to it where it was, uh, you know, you were just dollars to, to the person. And so there was incentives uh-huh. that weren't paid. There was, um, you know, very, very clear opportunities to build relationships with the team that were missed and probably not even just missed, but neglected. And so it just wasn't a a very warm environment to work within. Okay. So it was just the, the leader was just counting the money, focusing on them. And yeah, you were were basically a balance sheet. Like this is how much you cost the company. Are you bringing in more or less? And yeah, I mean, oh, there's clear profitability in the company. I mean, the the gentleman was making, uh, he was probably grossing $2 million a month and and we were, you know, there was making twelve fifty an hour. So I didn't have any complaints about how much <laughs> I was making because at the time that was yes. just fine, but it was just the environment, the, 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 the lack of appreciation, not, not from a financial position, but just from a, a genuine human appreciation just wasn't there. Yeah, and that's something that is true. Like people will stay, and it's not all about the money, but you. It's all, but it is about being appreciated and seeing that your work has impact. That what you're doing matters, and it matters to your superiors and to the clients. So all the line. But if you get like messages like, oh, no, it's. I don't care about you that much. <laughs> right. It don't matter to me. Yeah. And then when you have also your salary is not stellar, eh, it's not a good combination. <laughs> so well, I'm, you know, I'm wondering. I, I, I was okay with that because I was in my my early twenties and uh, you know I didn't have a lot of a lot of debt 
And so it wasn't really the actual dollar amount. It was just the circumstances that we were working within. Exactly. And that's something that I find that it's important to realize. It's, it's not all about the money. It's, right. Some people are really happy. Like if you create, like I know companies that have, they have some of the lowest wages in, in a city, but they have a company culture that people feel so great working there that they don't even think about switching jobs. And they enjoy going to work each day and they don't feel it like work. So they say, right. I'm also getting yeah. paid to have fun each day. How awesome yeah. is that? Yeah, there's a lot of opportunities to enjoy what you do. And, and so that was definitely a lesson learned. But I, you know, me as an employer now, I was able to take away the value of the relationships um, from your team and, and build that, actually have a team, not just employees. And how, how, what did you learn from all this experience and how did you practically apply it like in your company? Well, that's what, what I work with now is, is kind of like that last comment I said is now I try and build a team instead of having employees. And so uh, I, I build long lasting relationships. So I've never had, you know, I, a cl- I've never had an employee quit. I, ha- I had one employee quit in 13 years and it was because they had another opportunity that I encouraged them to take. And other than that, I've never had an employee quit. You know, I've had, um, my longest employee is 11 years now and nice. uh, we added three new this week. And so I really try to align myself with people that can grow together with the company and then build a relationship with them and, and not count them as, as just, you know, dollars in dollar out. And it sounds like you're truly putting value on building relationships with your employees. They're, they're not like employees. They're more like, would you say like a part of your family also? Well, I wouldn't quite go that far. I think there's certainly <laughs> some relationships that are more personal than others. You know, I've had some yes, employees of ask me to be in their wedding and I've had one employee ask me to be a godfather of their new ch- their new child. And so we definitely have deep relationships, but um, at the same time, there's a healthy balance of, you know, allowing them to, it's not that I wouldn't welcome that, but I think there's um, also a healthy reason to, to keep a little bit of division. Oh, okay. And it's true. It's not like <laughs> they move in, in your house with you. Yeah. Uh, and now I'm really curious, what is the biggest leadership success story you've witnessed personally? Well, I guess it's almost kind of kind of the same story where I've, I've grown such a, a, a successful agency that's established such great relationships with my team. You know, my team is all over the world. We have um, half of them here in the United States in different locations. And then the other half is, you know, across Asia and largely in the Philippines. And so I went out just um, just actually right before the coronavirus started rolling out. And I had the opportunity to go meet um, eight of them. And so that was fun to go island hopping and just like build that relationship and establish, you know, further roots with your team and having a team that proactively fights for you and the growth and the benefit of the company is something that I'm really proud of where we all have a vested interest in this together and we're all supporting each other. And how, what are you doing to, to encourage this proactive attitude from your uh, from your people so we do a couple things you know i think it starts with um the obvious first thing is to start with fair compensation and so make sure that they feel valued financially but then also just like the little things so even though this year i had the opportunity to go meet a lot of them in person when they're overseas um you know because the ones that are stateside and local then i can meet with them a little more frequent and then the ones that are international to still give them that extra attention and go out and meet them in person and then even in the years prior to me going out and meeting them in person i would still you know have them organize company building events. And so many of them had met each other, even though I hadn't met them in person. And so I'll still organize the opportunity for them to grow together as a team. So, you know, we talk daily on Skype and so we build these relationships, but I also try and find ways that we can connect even further um, on on like that human level and not just the paycheck level. (laughs) I like that human level not paycheck level yeah which is important it's really important and i and i like that you're 
building relationships. And especially since you have like an international team and part of it is remote, uh, do you find it hard to manage like the culture clash and uh, the time zones and everything? Or, and would you have some tips like how to make it smoother? Yeah, the, it was probably a little more, took a little more getting used to in the first year or two, but I've, I've had a team overseas for, you know, at least 10 years now. So I'm used to it now, but probably what I've learned is um, to really pay attention to your gut when you're trying to, um, when you're seeing how people engage, because a lot of times you can tell little things. So depending on the job, you know, let's say in my case, uh, I'm working on hiring another designer. And so design is about good converting designs and not so much grammar and English. And so I may be a little more flexible as they message me if there's spelling and grammar mistakes. But, you know, in one of my more recent positions I hired was for a design lead. And so they okay. have the quality control, you know, some of the text that is within these designs. So in that circumstance, it is more important to pay attention to the grammar and spelling. And so pay attention to the little things, depending on how you communicate with them. Usually it's over some sort of messenger like Skype. Um, pay attention, you know, do they capitalize the letter I or do they leave it all lowercase? Uh, do they use proper punctuation? And so you have to think about how they are going to represent your company. Um, and then another thing is, you know, a lot of times when you hire overseas, people are concerned about uh, quality control and security. So the first thing with the quality control is your, your team members and your employees are going to be only as good as the documentation that you can provide them. So you can't expect to hire somebody and they just immediately are efficient at their task if you don't give them very clear steps. So you first need to take the opportunity to really define what this person will be doing because they're going to be as good or as bad as the documentation that you can provide them. Now, yes. probably the next biggest thing that comes up is, well, how do I give them logins to a website or how do I give them, you know, payment access to a company credit card? So there's a couple things that you can do. I use Dashlane for password management. A lot of people will be familiar with LastPass. It's kind of the same thing. Yes. So that way you can share access to websites without actually exposing the login and then you can revoke the login at any time. Now, as far as payments, I have several of my team members that have company credit cards. And so what I do is I just set limits on them. So for example, if one employee has, uh, is, is expected to spend three to $400 a month on a card, then I'll just set a limit for 500. So I set it slightly above because that way, if they need to spend a little more for the company that month. I don't have to go waste time logging in or calling the credit card company to adjust that budget, but it's also close enough and low enough that if something crazy happened, if the card was compromised, that it's a pretty minimal loss. But, you know, between Dashlane, <clears throat> excuse me, between Dashlane and, you know, setting payment limits and documenting processes, I've never had any problems in 10 years. And since you're talking about documented processes, because I find it, people avoid doing it because it's hard. It's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you have to slosh from it, at least from my experience. And so most of the times people are placed in a position and say, like, you figure it out. <laughs> if you have questions, <laughs> ask me and I'll try to help you. But no real concrete documentation is offered. Um, how much time do you spend like on creating the documentation? And um, if you can share like some stories uh, or have, or have you do been doing documentation from the beginning or it's something that you mm -hmm. implement later on so you can share some stories before and after having documentation? Yeah. So the, the first year or two when I started my company, it was, I was kind of a one man show. And so I didn't really need documentation too much. But then as I started to grow and hire one and three and five employees, then I started to document. So before, yeah, I didn't have, I, I had processes, but some of them were on this file and others were on the spreadsheet and some are in my head. And so as we were growing, I said, I, I really ought to streamline these and have one location for these processes and okay. so at that point i i spent it, it, you're right it does suck to document um, especially <laughs> yes. if you're you're doing a lot and so i had to do a lot because 
what I wanted to do was document absolutely everything. And I wanted to do it only once. And so I wanted to make sure I did it really well. And, you know, I have to update it every once in a while as processes change, but I didn't want to have to, I didn't want to do it only part way, knowing that I didn't do it really efficiently. And so it took me probably, I would guess an hour or two every other day for a year for us to go through oh. all of our processes. Um, and then now what I do to minimize such a big, you know, update. So that was probably when the company was five or six years old. And so that was, you know, seven years ago. Um, but what I do now is when we have a new process or a new task, if I feel like it's something that we're likely to reproduce or have to do again, then either me or my, I'll assign a team member to document it right then. And so that way it's, small chunks of documentation as new things come along instead of having to do a lot and try and, and try to remember what was new from the last year. Yeah. And that makes sense. And still it took like one year to get it done, which is something you have to realize like the scale. If you have a successful business, it pays off to have the, the maybe not all the processes, but just the major ones and the, medium who wants to have them documented because it saves saves a lot of time and a lot of headaches, especially when onboarding people and or promoting them or switching them from one one type of job to another. So all kinds of situations. And I guess they freed up a lot of your time eventually. Yeah, well, you know, it freed up my time as an owner, but then also improved quality control. So as long as the oh. employees properly read the documentation, then they can't mess it up. And it, like you said, boarding clients, it made us scalable more effectively. So we had uh, one of our largest clients after, you know, this was when this happened, however many years ago, we had one of our largest clients to date come on board and, and I had to hire, I think, five employees within just a short time yes. frame. And there's no way that I could have done that without our processes documented. But because we had them documented, I could confidently bid on the contract. We were fortunate enough to win the contract. And then I could, you know, interview the talent. And once I found the right talent, then I could easily plug them into our processes. Awesome. I never thought about documentation as providing scale to a to, and the flexibility to scale as fast as necessary because hey, mm -hmm. you have it all. Say we need 5, 10, 15 more people. We can handle it because we don't have to dedicate 15 of our own people to train them and bring them up to speed in one month or two months. And right. those 15 people already have jobs and stuff to do. Yeah. So it becomes... Yeah, go. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was you know, day one was welcoming them to the team day two was you know here's the client you're working on and then here's access to the crm and then day three they just went to work awesome that's an amazing story i love it i wish more more companies would take the time to document and go through the pain of doing it it will make such so much more pleasurable when starting a new position right um and based on uh, your experience, Damon, what would you say is your leadership philosophy? Uh, if I had to summarize, it would, it would definitely be what we talked about earlier about building a team. So I do not want to micromanage. Um, so that kind of blends all the topics we've talked about, about hiring a team and then documenting processes. So I like to... Largely, obviously, I have to hire based on skill set, but then I also like to consider how well the person will integrate with the rest of the team to maintain that healthy balance. And so I really put a strong effort on actually hiring someone that can join the team, not just somebody that can, you know, clock in and clock out. And how do you evaluate if a person? would jive with the existing team you could, that goes back to what i was talking about your gut so really lean on um you know what your <clears throat> excuse me what your initial reactions to them are and then there's also some things you can do to proactively kind of 
filter some candidates. So for example, I like to use what people call an Easter egg. And so when I post the, the job listing, I'll start at the top. I'll, I'll say, Hey, you know, I'm, um, this is the company and these are all these cool things and then get the person excited. But then I'll skip the middle for a second and I'll go back down to the bottom and talk about, you know, here's your compensation. Here's all these cool things that we do. And then in the middle is where I put like the Easter egg. I'll put something that says message me on Skype and say, my favorite animal is a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Just something completely bizarre Uh, that nobody would message you in reality. Because if you think about it, what you're trying to identify is somebody that reads and follows directions. And usually candidates are in a hurry are going to be the ones that are not efficient at their job. And so the people that scan these job listings usually look at the top and the bottom to see what's in it for them. And so you answer those questions, what's in it for them and help them out. But then you also have to protect yourself. What's in it for the company's best interest is somebody that reads directions. And so that will, that's a big time saver that will eliminate half of the candidates because every time I post a job listing, um, you know, I'll, I'll specifically say, don't message me on this platform. Instead, you know, either send me an email here or Skype me here. And I still get half of the candidates to send me a direct message. And so that allows me to easily eliminate half of the resumes that I have to look at because they didn't read and follow directions. Yes, exactly. And it's good that you get half of them that follow directions. I know of a company that used like this technique. It wasn't actually like an Easter egg, but I said like, if you want to apply to this job, the only way you can do it is by phone. You have to phone in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and nobody called it. The, the inbox was filled with messages, but nobody yeah. was willing to follow the directions. Like, yeah, there there was a lady that um, this isn't you know work related, but there was a lady. I can't remember what the company was, but they put in their terms and conditions. They buried it way deep, and there was a thing that said, "If you contact us this way." you know, congratulations on reading all these small details. We have, I think it was like a $10,000 prize and oh. nobody read the instructions except for one lady. And so one lady followed the directions and it, it was on the news. This was probably, I don't know, six or seven years ago, maybe longer. And so this lady, this lady won a bunch of money for doing nothing other than just reading the terms and conditions. Being diligent and doing, doing properly because you also want, you want people to have read everything that you posted there because you put work work and time to make sure that they in a way pre-qualify themselves like yes i can right. do all this stuff it's not like oh, another job apply another job apply yep. and yep. maybe some of them <laughs> will stick yeah exactly well, so it's important but sometimes you don't get no qualified people so it's like you have to find the balance like to so say like where do we draw the line how uh, how stringent should we be in some yeah. situations? Uh, and Damon, for aspiring leaders, what would be your top three leadership tips you have for them? I would say the, uh, the, the most common characteristics I see in people that are successful uh, are first, they start. So don't over plan because usually you know, don't delay starting because of over planning. Cause usually when you finally start all your plans change anyway. So don't feel like you need to <laughs> overthink how to start your project or your business. Um, likewise, don't rely on funding. So let's say you want to start a new business. It's so bizarre to me nowadays, how the majority of people think they have to go get a loan or they have to get venture capital investments. Uh, the, the, there, there's beauty in starting without funding. A, you have no debt, but B, you actually learn. There's so many things that happen during the process of starting small that are valuable to you as you grow. And if you skip that, let's say you do get funding, you skipped all those learning curves. So now how are you going to address those problems when somebody else wants their money back because they invested on you? And so starting without funding is actually a blessing. Um, The other thing that I would say is success takes time. There's a bunch of sayings that are along the lines of overnight success takes 10 years. And there's a lot of truth to that. 
the social media glorifies entrepreneurship, which is great. It's great to celebrate your wins, but you have to earn those wins. And so start yes. and don't give up are going to be the two main things. And it sounds so simple, but the more I mentor other people, the more I see other people start businesses and entrepreneurships or want to, those are by far the single biggest difference makers is if you actually start and then you don't stop. Yes. And it's funny because I was thinking as you were seeing these tips, like from the point of an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs, leader, leading entrepreneurs, but they also apply like in the corporate world, at least from my perspective, especially mm -hmm. the don't rely on funding because I've seen people that they say they want to grow and they want to grow their departments and, uh, and everything, and they had like amazing projects that uh, they wanted to do and said about, we don't have no funding for, for them. I want to improve my skill set. I want to do all this stuff, but we need money. And the CFO isn't approving anything uh, on those lines. And we, they don't want mm -hmm. to spend money. They don't want to invest. And I told them, look, okay, we'll get to spending more money. But until... The, the part of spending money, there's so many free things you can do that you're not doing now mm -hmm. to start generating something, to show more work. And then the if value. people see, okay, we're, they're generating value, they start investing a little more, give them a little more budget, start making more. Because yeah. I, I, I've seen also the reverse of people saying, ah, we could do such great things with this department if we got a little more funding and they got the funding, they blew all the money, no results were generated yeah. and nothing to show. It was uh, maybe they learned some lessons from it, but it caused the business and it's, it's, it wasn't in a, in a good way. But if you show mm -hmm. a start, if you start and show a track record, then you're going to start also getting money, funding from inside the business and just keep, keep going. Don't, don't stop. So it applies. It's not only for entrepreneurs, it's for everybody that wants to progress and even in corporate life. Yeah. There, I mean, there's value in proof of concept. So whether it's starting a new business, you, you want to prove the concept before you take on funding, uh, whether it's expanding a department, you know, prove the concept that it's worth expanding. So there's a lot of value in, in proof of concept. You know, let's say you start a business and, and there's no market for it. You may think it's the most amazing thing, but it doesn't matter what you think it matters what the market thinks and so that's why you don't want to over plan because half the time you start the market will tell you that you need to change direction doesn't doesn't mean you need to stop it just means hey you know this other path would be more effective exactly and for example some an, an example that you could relate easily to it um it was about a marketing department but they weren't doing like posting stuff regularly on Facebook or LinkedIn or writing articles on the website or uh, um, so all the stuff that you could do it, you already paid, you were there for eight hours, you could have done it, but they were stuck in it because they needed more money to buy swag, to give away. They wanted right. to go to trade shows so with booths and do giveaways and contests and all this stuff, but they weren't, they weren't doing like the basic stuff to start bringing value to the, to the company itself. Yeah. You know, there's one client that we started consulting with their big international company and their, their budget, usually their departments when they have a new launch, um, you know, they're a, a re very successful company, billions of dollars. And so they kind of do things a little bit backwards and we're coming in and trying to help them clean it up because historically what they've done <laughs> is the departments say, uh, well, well, actually, the, the, the management goes down to the departments and says, you know, here's $80,000, go get us exposure. And so then the marketing department goes, great, let's go burn $80,000. And so their goal is just to spend $80,000. It's not to turn $80,000 into $200,000, which is what it should be. And so we have to go in there and tell them to reverse it and say, okay, you know, now if you guys ever want more money or you know, you need to prove your track record. You guys can't because you don't have any action items. You're just spending the money. No results. So yeah, you need to have proof, you know, the proof of concept, show results. And so it's, it's an interesting example that's a little bit backwards from what you usually hear. 
Uh, well, I also heard like in a also big international company that came here in Romania, they gave this guy, uh, I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand euros to spend on mm -hmm. marketing and promotion and all this stuff. And he, at the end of the year, he said proudly that he only spent 10,000 of it. And he said like, that's why, and the bosses were like, infuriated, like that's why, that's why we have crap results. You didn't spend the money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could go that way. Yeah. It could be too conservative. <laughs> exactly. So you, you, as you said, you need to provide an ROI. So you need to have, right, we put this, we generated this and preferably the, the end result is bigger than the initial input. Exactly. Uh, and Damon, I am really curious. What is the book that had the most profound impact on you? Uh, two books come to mind, and I, I read okay. them both about the same time. One is E-Myth Revisited, which a lot of people will be familiar with, and the other is 4-Hour Workweek, which a lot of people also know. So... The, the value that those books provided for me is um, actually I take that back Four hour work week. I, I listened to before e -Myth. So when I was listening to four hour work week, I had four or five employees and okay. a lot of the stuff discussed in the book I was already doing. But when I finished it, one thing that I realized is why don't I have, why am I not giving my team more responsibilities and why am I not, scaling internally why am i not bringing on more team members and more vas and so within maybe four weeks after that i had doubled our team members and Whoa. so that way i could start to you know further free up my time to focus on growing the company and top level things and then sharing that responsibility more with the team um, and then the other book the uh, e-myth revisited really helped with uh, emphasizing the importance of documenting processes that we talked about. So at the time, I knew the importance of documenting processes, but going through that book I, is when I kind of had that extra clarity where I need to consolidate, you know, the spreadsheet and the the file and what's in my head and put it into one system. And that really contributed to our scalability shortly after when we started getting those bigger clients that I mentioned. Really good. Now I have to ask you. Are you working only four hours a week now? No, no, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> no, but you know, the entrepreneurship thing is one of those things where it sounds a little cliche, but the, the, the drive behind doing the whole entrepreneurial spirit is, is where I, I find my passion. That's where I find my enjoyment. So I don't mind. I don't work crazy like 60 hour weeks, 70 hour weeks, um, but I work a healthy balance of, you know, a lot as the business owner, but not more the, than, you know, I, I work probably a lot less than other entrepreneurs that work the crazy good. 15 hour days every day. That's really good. And Damon, if people want to find out more about you, where should they go? Uh, social media, my platforms of choice are LinkedIn and Facebook. You can find me active on there. And then I also just finished writing a book. Uh, you can get a copy awesome. called it's called outrank you can get a free copy at free seobook.com and then in there there's no upsells or anything it's just a free download but on the thank you page there's an invite to a facebook group that i run and so i give away a lot of seo advice in that facebook group and i'm going to take you up on your generous offer and i encourage other people especially if they have a website and in the tech field it's kind of hard to to rank websites, there's lots of competition, lots of ideas flying. So get Damon's book, get the leg up on, on the competition. Yeah. Thank you, Damon. Yeah. Thanks so much, Andre. Appreciate the chat. Okay. Bye. Okay. See ya. That was today's episode. Tune in daily. Rate, like, subscribe, and share, please. Oh. You can find further info and materials in the show notes on techyleadership.com, including links to the guest book recommendations.